Hello and welcome to Indus Special. I'm Michelle Malik. Leading up to Australia's election day on May 18th, almost all major national polls indicated a sure win for the Labour Party. But in what has come as a complete shock to the Australian people, the Liberal National Coalition is back in power. Now, one key takeaway from this election is that opinion polls are dangerously misleading. But the Australian elections are not the first time when the polls have gotten it so very wrong. In fact, it seems like this has become a pattern of sorts. On tonight's show, we explore the reasons behind why opinion polls are wrong so often, the methodology behind these polls, and what are the problems with them. We also discuss why despite all these issues, these polls remain to play an important role in understanding public opinion. Joining us for this discussion today is Mr. Tim Kirby, who is an analyst joining us from Moscow. We're also joined by Professor Steve Keen, who is an economist joining us from Amsterdam. Thank you both for joining us. Before we move on to talking more about opinion polls, let's watch a short clip of Bill Shorten from the Labour Party conceding to defeat. I want to say beyond this room to Australians who supported Labour, I know that you're all hurting. And I am too. And without wanting to hold out any false hope, while there are still millions of votes to count and important seats yet to be finalised, it is obvious that Labor will not be able to form the next government. So, Professor Keane, let me begin with you. What are your comments on the shock of the result of the Australian elections, keeping in mind that almost all polls leading up to the elections stated that the Labour Party would win? I think one of the... Uh, it's a, I, I mean, in general, I agree with the thesis that there's something wrong with the polling system. But uh, one specific thing about the Australian system is that we have what are called uh, preferential voting. So you, uh, you give your first vote to vote to one uh, candidate. If the candidate loses uh, in the first round of counting, then their votes are allocated to you, give your second preference through, and so on, right down to the bottom. Uh, so when a poll asks a question, who are you going to give your first preference to, uh, you get an absolute advantage like the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, or let's say the Greens or One Nation, which is the right-wing racist party in the country. Now, uh, people then assume, they, they, they have formula by which they allocate the Greens vote to uh, whether it will go to Labor or Liberal. And they might normally say, well, Greens 80% vote for Labor and 20% vote for Liberal. Now, if in fact it happens that it goes 70% for Labor and 30% for Liberal, that can pass through unseen by the polling system. And that's what I think happened this time around. There'd be a large number of people who were particularly conservative uh, well, older people, retirees, who are worried about some of the comments made about what was going to happen to their retirement incomes, courtesy of Labor Party policies, but who are also concerned about the environment, who may have voted Green first to make their environmental statement and then Liberal second. And I think that would have completely passed the pollsters by. Yeah, so when we're talking about the polls in this regard, we have uh, I mentioned how it seems to have become a recurring pattern. We saw it in the U.S. presidential elections. We saw it at Bre in Brexit that polls seem to not indicate what is truly happening. Trying to dig more into the situation in Australia here, what do you think is unique to what went wrong in the polling system? Well, again, the fact that, the fact that they don't ask what are you going to do with your uh, second, third and fourth preferences, they, they just ask the first, pre first preference. Hmm. And then they use statistical techniques to allocate those from previous elections. Now, if there's a major change in the in part of the political landscape between the elections, and there has been a rise in terms of sentiment for green policies, even though the Liberal Party is fairly anti-green, uh, that shift in second preferences can completely overwhelm what the first preferences tell you. And I think the real question is that, is that polling is not as accurate as following social media. Social media is a much larger database these days, and people who will, be, say, will answer, I'm going to vote Labor, or I'm going to vote Liberal to a first preference question, uh, or say I vote Green to a first preference question, will then say uh, in, on social media, you know, I like the green. I, I like the green. Uh, green policies. I like uh, doing right. climate change, but I'm worried about my retirement right. money. Right. And and a very interesting point made there, Professor uh, Keen, is that polling is not as accurate as social media. Mr. Kirby, what are your comments on that statement made by Professor Keen? Uh, 
Well, um, the thing about polling is, is there's a, uh, the inaccuracies come from the methodology that they use to conduct the polls, and especially because uh, whenever they uh, do this sort of polling, um, there's always some means by which they exclude the uh, uh, a part of the audience. So basically, when someone votes for, let's say, President of the United States, every adult can vote. But when it comes to polling, a lot of times the polling the polls exclude the ability for everyone to vote. So, for example, if it's an online poll, the location of the poll actually uh, makes a huge difference. If it's on some sort of video game site, that may exclude a lot of older people and a lot of women. Uh, I know in Moscow, a lot of times they conduct polling uh, on the street during the middle of the day, offering people to put a dollar on their telephone, which sounds fair, but that really excludes most of the nation. Because if you work in the military, or if you work on an oil rig, or if you work at night, or if you don't feel like talking to some random person on the street, then your vote is essentially not counted, and this can really skew the results. Right. So, Mr. Kirby, let me get this straight. What you're trying to say here is that it's the sample size it's, uh, that is the main issue here for why polls seem to be inaccurate or incorrect. Well, correct. It's the sample size and a lot of the ways that uh, voting for a uh, president involves every adult. It could be the, the po every adult has a possibility to participate, but the methodology that they use for polling often excludes a lot of people or really limits um, their scope of uh, uh, possible um, people who can answer the poll. So basically, the results on the street are very different from a national poll. I could give you a very concrete example in Russia. Every year in Russia, a progressive or green uh, sort of hyper-liberal candidate, uh, whenever they have the uh, presidential elections, gets around 1% to 2%. So this is sort of a stable uh, tradition. However, that same candidate could get 20 or 30% from the Moscow-based polling, where most of the companies that are engaged in different sorts of market research, be they uh, political or be they consumer, are all located in Moscow. So for that particular green progressive liberal candidate, will always get a large skew if the polling is done on the streets of Moscow, always. Right. On a national level, they'll never get 20 percent, not even close. Right. So the number you're putting out here and the example you've stated all go to show that it's not an accurate representation of what's actually going to happen. Why do you think that people still continue to rely so much on polls? Uh, may, may continue. I, continue. I just I think the date about it is the fact that the media often then takes these skewed polls, they pick the ones they like, the ones that sort of suit their narrative, and then they present them as facts. And then when the elections come around, uh, people already sort of have an assumption in their minds about what the results of the election should be. And that's very dangerous uh, if you're concerned about democracy and getting fair results. Right. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Keen, going, going back to you, following Mr. Kirby said, he's tr almost talking about this double uh, problem here, that it's not just the methodology that's skewed. It's also that these polls are then manipulated by media organizations manipulated by political parties to portray a certain picture. Uh, what is your take on that? How dangerous do you think that is? I think that varies from country to country to country. Certainly in Australia's case, I, I've been involved in the uh, polling organizations many, many years ago. And the way they're done in Australia is there are consumer surveys which are sent out to a proportion of households, one or two thousand households. Um, and then the, at the bottom of those consumer survey questions are questions about voting intentions. So it hasn't got the problem of being unrepresentative as, as, the, as in the Russian example. But uh, it's, it's, it's again that the, it's too blunt an instrument. The sample size, you're quite right. You know, statistically, people say a sample of 2,000 people with a area, give you an error margin and a, a probable capacity to predict how a country of 20 million is going to vote. Um, but given especially the uh, the nuances of the Australian system with the preferential voting, it doesn't get the mood. Right. And if the mood is such that people are going to say, well, I'm going to vote, yes, first preference will go to the Greens, but second preference, rather than normally being Labor, I'm going to go Liberal because I'm worried about my franking credits, which is a, a part of the retirement income effectively. Uh, then the previous statistical methods they use to allocate those first preference to second, third and fourth will be wrong.
Right. And uh, I, I certainly haven't looked in detail at these current numbers, but that's my feeling as to what happened this time this time round. The people who were expected to vote uh, a certain proportion, second preference, Labor Liberal, gave a much larger percentage of that to the Liberal Party than the Labor. And there is one precedent in Australia's history. In 1961, the Conservative Prime Minister, Liberal Party Prime Minister Robert Menzies, won the election by one seat because of the leakage of Communist Party preferences to the Liberal Party. Right. So, of course, it's, uh, we can see how uh, that's influencing here. But, Professor Akeen, has it always been this way? Now, uh, before, when uh, polls were taken, surveys were conducted, the telephone was a very integral, uh, integral part in the process, calling people up, asking uh, for their opinions. Now, do you think that the procedure of conducting these surveys has also drastically changed and that could somehow influence results as well? Uh, it's certainly in Australia, Australia, there hasn't been a major change in the, in the methodology. They're still using consumer surveys and tacking on these questions at the end. Uh, there are others using phone calls and so on. Of course, with phone usage, you, 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 uh, your other your commentator is quite correct uh, in, in a global sense. Uh, the youth are more likely to be holding the mobile phones, more likely to answer them. So the, the way in which you sample biases the part of the population that actually answers the questions. And uh, that is probably a factor as well on the most recent Australian result. But I think it shows that uh, the, the volatility uh, in people's political uh, sentiments these days uh, is quite high. We have a level of disillusionment with uh, the political process, uh, with the capacity of leaders to make anything resembling simple, uh, sensible decisions, mm -hmm. that there's a fragility in the vote that wasn't there certainly 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. And because of that fragility, the methodology then starts to fail. Right. So they, we used to talk about what they, they used to say, there were bolted on Labor voters and bolted on Liberal voters. Well, that was back in the days when people had a degree of trust or faith in the political parties. If they don't, then swings in sentiment can have much more dramatic impact than the polling is going to pick up. Right. And uh, Professor Kik, an important point there, the fragility present in the voters. And Mr. Kirby, following from that, do you think that in the political climate that exists nowadays, voters are often more undecided? And since polling takes place at a specific point in time, the results they give, the answers they may give might change in the future. And that's why results might shift? Well, uh, that's, uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, people could change their minds. And very often, as the polls go down the road, and especially the American elections, uh, people, especially the independent voters, do switch back and forth. Uh, one thing that also have, we have to bear in mind is that, uh, with, depending, like uh, our other guests uh, mentioned, there are different political systems, different electoral systems. And, for example, in the United States, because we have this first-past-the-poll system, there's a lot of strategic voting where people pick the lesser of two evils. However, when they uh, engage in polling, people are a lot more likely to pick someone like Gary Johnson or Jill Stein from the third parties that has no chance of winning, because in the polling, it really doesn't matter to the mm. end result, whereas people believe that strategic voting is important to get their uh, lesser of two evils uh, in in the long run. So the system matters uh, very much in that particular instance. Right. And But let's move on to another form of polling, exit polls. Why is it that once people do vote, uh, those are also seem to be incorrect? If we're following from these arguments that these are some of the issues that exist uh, with pre-polls. Well, about exit polls, if I may, I can say one thing. An exit poll is public uh, because especially when Barack Obama was um, uh, first elected to president of the United States, uh, there were a lot of uh, accusations that uh, if you didn't vote for Obama, uh, that somehow means you're racist. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, the Democrats uh, were able to um, implant that meme into American society. So I can imagine that some people who didn't vote for Obama may have actually been a little bit nervous to say that they didn't vote for Obama publicly right. Right. Uh, in that particular, because doing something publicly is a lot more difficult than it is to do it privately. Right. And uh, Professor Keen, we're talking about all things that probably go through a voter's mind while they are voting, uh, uh, while they're thinking about who they're going to vote fall, uh, before the elections and even when they talk about who they voted for after the elections. So is it, uh, tell me, what do you think about the fact that polls and almost, uh, almost try to quantify these very complex human emotions that run through a voter's mind? 
Yeah, I, th I think it's again, it's again, it's too blunt an instrument. Uh, what uh, the polls are doing, uh, even at the exit polls themselves, and it's quite right. People, as Tim said, people are embarrassed to uh, sometimes to say who they actually voted for, and there's no, in, you know, they're basically hanging onto their own self-image by lying in that sense. Uh, but it's a very blunt instrument, and we, it, it, and the the volume of information that exists on social media these days is quite enormous. And again, of course, that's biased in terms of which groups get themselves involved in social media. But I've seen quite a few studies uh, now of the of the uh, Facebook pages of the different parties in Australia. And it was obvious that the Liberal Party was getting more hits uh, than the Labor Party was. And those hits were skewed by age. So the older voters were voting more for the Liberals, largely because they were concerned about their uh, uh, the impact of labour taxation policies on their retirement incomes. So I think, in a sense, it is is a, uh, a judgment day for polling systems. They really have to say, let's abandon this sampling technique we've been using and let's go into analysis of social media and that may give them a more realistic uh, line right. than they get on the polls. Right, but Professor King, we have to also acknowledge that with social media, there comes a lot of baggage as well. Now, we were talking about how people might be embarrassed to get labeled a certain way if they tell people who they voted for. On social media, don't you think that's even more amplified? You get the backlash immediately if you put out a political statement, if you show allegiance to a political party. Yeah, again, but it, it can be like, it's like how many pages page views there are. And a page view uh, doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't you, you can look at a page without actually believing in a page. Uh, but at the statistical level, in the enormous volumes, then the amount of the pages you look at can give an indication of which ones have got the attention of the public versus those that don't. So I think uh, there, there may be a, quite a bit of time for pollsters now to have to start developing a, a methodology to be able to sample those and, and effectively backcast if they can and see if they can predict the elections they got wrong using those techniques and then use those for the next election along with polling. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Tim, while we're talking about all of this, and uh, both of you alluded to words and explicitly stated, actually, the fact that many people are embarrassed about who they vote for. Um, this is often regarded now as the shy Tory uh, uh, phenomena in psychology and sociology when we're talking about voter behavior. Why do you think that the political climate has become such that people become more embarrassed about who they're voting for? Do you think it's something unique to today? Uh, no, I think that there's always going to, going to be some sort of uh, established status quo, and whoever goes really far against that status quo could seem to be crazy or strange or treacherous or so on. Um, I don't think that it's really any particular new phenomenon. Uh, but uh, one thing that I can say is it's not just embarrassment per se, uh, like the possibility of being accused of being racist with Obama, but it can even be fear. Uh, remember, uh, Ukraine recently had presidential elections, and in that country, well, speaking as someone who lives in Russia, uh, for a lot of people in Ukraine who are Russian-speaking, uh, it's a very scary time to voice your opinions anywhere online because you could get a knock on the door for supporting certain positions. Mm. Uh, so uh, for those people, some sort of uh, online poll could actually be very terrifying because they won't want to openly with some sort of record of voice um, certain political positions, which they could be literally and directly punished for. Right. And with that, do you think that if there was uh, more anonymity attached to these polls, uh, the accuracy of them, the validity of them would change? Well, then when you get into uh, anonymity, what happens is trolling. Um, there have been many uh, online uh, Tests that have been destroyed by people with the uh, ability to troll and use fake accounts. So if we have online polling where everything is linked to people in real life, then the whole world knows your opinions. If we have total anonymity, then essentially all sorts of bots can vote for whatever position they want. Uh, so as you see, um, there's this um, sort of uh, exciting idea that one day we'll have this digital democracy. But in a lot of ways, as I just described, it's a uh, double-edged sword and neither edge is particularly sharp. Right. And uh, uh, Mr. Kirby, you make a strong point there. Professor Keane, what are your comments to that? Is there anything more you can add to what uh, Mr. Keen, uh, Mr. Kirby talked about here? Uh, no, I think it is true that the, the, the issue of anonymity 
uh, versus total exposure is a very complicated one in every possible way. I mean, I'm very active on Twitter and uh, I see so many people who have names which are not uh, totally, you, know, you have no idea who you're talking to. Uh, and, and that is uh, partly they're protecting themselves to be able to make statements that if they put their own names to it, they'd be very worried about uh, political exposure and, and, and social embarrassment. So uh, it, there's no easy solution to this. And maybe we have to accept we simply can't know uh, the public's mind, the collective mind in advance in the way we thought we did with polling in the past. Right. But do you think that there are any chances that the companies and those who conduct these polls also manipulate the results? And it's not just happening at the user's end or the person who's responding. Well, see, a lot of this polling is bought for, bought for by the political parties themselves. And uh, there can be a certain confirmation bias in how they choose to do it. One ironic thing about the uh, new, the Australian election is that the Labour Party, which is the progressive party in Australian politics, uh, used the same polling company that was being used by the, the Australian, which is run by Rupert Murdoch. As a very extremely reactionary uh, uh, media uh, owner. So, st strangely enough, the, both those sides were looking at polls telling them Labor was going to win. Now, what actually was the difference is the Liberals were doing more targeted polling, checking out the marginal seats and seeing what was happening in the marginal seats. And their polling was sensing that there was a leakage of, uh, of votes towards them uh, over key issues, particularly over how retirees would be affected by Labor's tax policies. So in that sense, the, the more targeted polling by the Liberal Party going down to a seat-by-seat -seat basis was more accurate. And I think, again, that's that sort of thing is going to be necessary. It's not going to be cheap to get this right. right. I think in many ways what happened in the past was this technique was relatively cheap, very profitable for the polling companies, and because there was a that bolted-on effect, uh, of voters who could be relied upon to vote the same way in, in, indefinitely and, and, their, and their survey results were accurate, that's gone. So right. with that gone, they've, they've got to spend more money uh, doing more forms of analysis before they make their predictions. Right. And uh, with that, uh, stay with us, uh, Professor Keen. We're also joined by Mr. Brett Yonkers, who's a journalist joining us from Belgium. Thank you so much, Mr. Yonkers, for joining us. Now, we've been talking about all the problems related to polling polls and how inaccurate they are. But in your opinion, why do you think they are still important in the political realm and in the social realm? Well, I, I think that the reason why, reason why polls are still so widely used is because people in many cases, especially, of course, in countries where, uh, where voting is obligatory, uh, people are often still wondering, you know, what the political system is that they are staying and what the political developments probably will be. Uh, and aside from that, of course, polling is a very, uh, very profitable business for news uh, broadcasters themselves. You know, it's difficult, to, of course, to, for many news agencies to to make accurate uh, journalistic predictions or, mm. or even articles about the elections without quote unquote knowing or at least predicting uh, what the, the result most likely will be. Uh, in, in, in my personal uh, case, living in Belgium where elections will happen next Sunday, we, we also have numerous polls coming in uh, and, and, which, and it can, I can see that in day to day life it is very important for people when they talk about elections, especially people who are undecided voters, in which they, they like having something to fall back upon. Of course, mm. the question that can be asked is whether or not this can be dangerous as it will influence, of course, the public opinion. Right. And what about the climate in Belgium right now? Do you think people are wary of these polls coming out or do you think that they actually do have influence even after we're hearing about this latest uh, controversy or this uh, inaccurate depiction of what was going to happen in the Australian elections? Well, in, in what I see on the ground in Belgium now is that there is a pretty big, uh, I, I'm afraid there will be a pretty big bandwagon effect for the, uh, the right-wing extremist party, which according to the la latest uh, polls would be the third biggest party, uh, at least in the north of the country. Very complicated voting system here, but uh, the, you see that there are many people who are most likely going to be influenced quite a lot. Uh, by the polls that are coming out, and the news, uh, the news regarding Australia hasn't really reached uh, many people here. The news regarding the the, the mistaken polls there, uh, so I don't think that news item will influence people in distrusting the polls that uh, that are happening now here.
Right. And Mr. Kirby, following from that, tell us about your opinions regarding the influence that these polls still have, and especially something that uh, Mr. Yonkers mentioned regarding the bandwagon effect. Um, well, about uh, the, uh, the influence of um, polls, um, what they do is essentially any idea, be it uh, possibly, I don't know, how, even maybe a religion, political ideology, or something minor, a minor view on history, whatever idea gets in the heads of people first, it's very hard later to dislodge that idea, to convince them otherwise. And most people are actually very resistant to any information which contradicts their established worldview, even if that information um, and contradiction might actually be better for them. So when you have uh, the entire media in a particular country saying, uh, saying that uh, candidate A has won, candidate A is going to crush candidate B, it uh, demotivates people from voting. Uh, it also makes it uh, no one question the fact, uh, question the victory of candidate A because they already established in everyone's mind that they're already the winner. You see what I mean? So it has yeah. a demotivating factor and it has um, the ability to sort of possibly mask uh, any sort of, um, uh, let's say, uh, unfair play in the electoral process. I take your point there. And what about the increasing polarized atmosphere? Do you think polarization plays any role into this uh, whole game? Uh, if you mean regarding polling, um, I don't think that the polls really cause the polarization. I would actually say that it's the uh, fact that we live in a global liberal system that does, where we're all atomized. Uh, down to individuals and everything is focused on the individual, but that's a more philosophical theme. No, I don't think polls really divide us. They more, well, they already sort of reflect the divisions in society. For example, in America, there really is a strong division between a left-wing and right-wing view. The fact that there is this Democrat and Republican Party, uh, those parties really do reflect uh, American life. However, it could be the fact that we have a two-party system that makes America become divided into these two camps. That's very possible as well. Uh, art reflects life and life re reflects art. But you see what I mean? So I don't yeah. really think that polling but, is but, the and, particular cause. It's more of a reflection. It, it is a reflection. But what about the fact that since the world is so uh, polarized, it's hard to extrapolate the results onto the uh, population? Is that something you would agree with? Uh, to get the, you mean the, the fi final results of the election? Well, that's a, usually a question uh, for the government. Uh, but about getting the results to the public, again, we have to also remember that there are often many polls conducted. They have uh, different results. And so there can be a lot of, uh, especially on the part of the media, some sort of mm, confirmation bias. You know, especially when Hillary Clinton was uh, challenging Donald Trump, uh, the major news networks all took all the poll results that said that Hillary Clinton was going to win and chose to show those, you know, sort of uh, wishful thinking, because many polls actually did show that Trump uh, uh, would win and that he or that he had a chance. But uh, CNN and the others chose not to show those particularly often, if at all. Right. And uh, Mr. Yonkers, how dangerous is that? We have talked a little about when uh, media organizations and the public pick uh, and choose which polls to show. But in this case, can that just even change the whole uh, turnout, the whole result? If uh, the people who are supposed to communicate these results to you, the polls and stuff, are misleading you? Yeah, I think that is a very uh, important aspect and a very important risk that comes with, with polling. Like I said before, you, of course, you have the bandwagon effect in which people have the idea that, you know, they should probably vote for the party that is already biggest in the in, in the polls. There have been numerous researches into that. There is discussion about whether or not this is the bandwagon effect is completely scientifically provable. But I think it's very likely that it does play an influence. Secondly, uh, in many cases, when you're talking about uh, systems in which it has like two or three party domination system, like for example, the United States, but also Australia or the United Kingdom, for example, countries that are dominated by uh, a set number of parties, it is sometimes due to the polls very hard, even harder for, for third parties or for new parties, smaller parties to break through, especially if there is a, uh, a minimum percentage that they have to keep. 
Uh, I've seen in many, in several cases, uh, especially in Belgium, but also in other countries, that, that certain parties who are struggling with getting, for example, the 5% margin in order to get into parliament, they eventually do not get, they lose a lot of votes in the last week or two weeks due to the election, because if they have to get the 5% margin and the poll, the last polls always say that they will get 4, 4.5%, there are often people who neglect, who wanted to vote for them, but then decide to what they call strategic voting. They say, you know, it's never, it's, it's not worth the effort anyway, so let's vote for a bigger party, even though they not necessarily want that party as their first choice, what they call strategic or lesser evil voting. And I think these, these are one of the many problems that, that, that uh, are that are arising sometimes due to the, the pollings, and especially if the polls are influenced by big media corporations or by political influencers, uh, such as, for example, was the case indeed in the United States. Right. Uh, uh, Professor Keane, the thing that Mr. Yonkers mentioned earlier in our discussion was the profitability, uh, the profitability aspect and how important polls are to media organizations especially. It, could there be a business behind this? Could there be a business behind creating polls or putting out polls in a certain way which bring in money? Do you think that there is something like that, an underlying factor like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the um, uh, uh, news is, uh, is, is, journalists used to say, what fills the gaps between the advertisements. And uh, one easy way to fill that gap is to report a survey. Uh, so I think, and then surveys themselves become uh, part of the news and there's a feedback process uh, we've seen happen many times in the Australian, Australian political scene. And of course in the UK where you're getting an outrageous volatility courtesy of the, uh, the Brexit vote splitting both Tory and, and Labor, and then that becomes news themselves. People then look, so what's happening with the polls now uh, becomes as important as who won the last football match. So there's certainly a, a profitability aspect to it, which I think distorts the entire process. Hmm. Right. And on that point, uh, Professor, we're going to take a short break. Stay with us and we're going to continue this discussion. Welcome back to In This Special. Now, while we continue our discussion, we are joined by Richard Harris, who is an analyst joining us from Berlin. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris, for joining us. Now, we've talked about almost an abysmal state of polls. We've painted a pretty bleak picture. But do you think that there is a future for polls still following all these string of events that have shown how inaccurate they can be? What we've seen recently is um, uh, a bit of a setback in people's perception of uh, what polling and exit polls should be, um, especially with um, what happened in Australia, where um, amazingly um, some uh, people had to be paid out by companies like Ladbrokes because they'd assumed that um, Labour had won the election. Uh, Mr. Kirby, something that Mr. Harris uh, pointed out was how during the elections in Australia, sports bet a company had to pay out at least $5.2 million because they already placed, uh, they already made payments assuming that the polls were right. So when the polls are not right, which other businesses like these get impacted? The, do elections impact business? That's very true because they can uh, raise and reduce uh, confidence, which can inf uh, affect um, uh, investment uh, across you know all sectors of the economy. But uh, I mean, uh, how much does polling directly affect the economy? I'm not really sure, but definitely whatever any guarantees um, within the uh, small community of investors that there are that there's going to be a stability. That's almost always good for the nation and good for business. Uh, however on the opposite end, an air of uh, instability or the fear that there could be some sort of political or economic uh, crash, uh, obviously that makes uh, investors want to pull out or put their money elsewhere, uh, which um, uh, is definitely uh, bad for the nation. Right. And Professor Keane, following from that, can you uh, tell us from an economist's point of view, what do you think is the impact of polling on the economy at large, if there is any? Well, actually, my, my attitude really is about the nature of the, the popularity contest that elections are. Uh, I think it's a, with the, in the world we're in now, you need people who can actually understand complex systems and assisted by computer software in doing so uh, to make intelligent decisions. Uh, with a popularity uh, process that is part of the political scene, and polls, of course, are about popularity uh, more than intelligence, I think we're leading ourselves into an ungovernable state.
So I'm, I'm not just a critic of polls, I'm a critic of the fact that we elect people whose major qualification for the job is they have a serious case of narcissistic personality disorder. We need people who can think uh, in those roles and be guided uh, in their thinking by systems analysis, not the, the type of uh, you know, popularity, uh, you know, silver, silverback gorilla types we tend to elect instead. Right. And uh, you've cl clearly demonstrated that you have a very cynical take on this. But do you think that there is any way to salvage this culture of predicting what's going to happen and then putting it out there, this poll culture? Well, again, getting, getting away from it being a popularity contest. Uh, it, 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 I think it's obvious that our, our political leaders, in terms of the problems we face, have failed us. Uh, and and that's partly we're seeing in the, the, even the electoral volatility itself is an indication of that. Democrat, Republican, Swiss shifts, um, Labor, Liberal, uh, people people being shafted inside their own political party. As in Australia's case, uh, we're losing election, uh, losing power in their own party because they're polling badly. And you go from one from a conservative on one front to a liberal on the same party and back to a conservative again, which is what Australia did. Uh, it's it's just a very inept way to manage human society in the incredibly complex world in which we live. So I think the, I, I wouldn't worry about reforming polling to make it more pre accurately predict who's going to win the popularity contest. I'd rather say, how do we reorganize our human society to still have representation, but to let people who have intelligent knowledge of systems be the ones who make the decisions about our world rather than people whose sole claim to fame is they can be popular on TV. Right. Mr. Richard Harris, on the point of instability and the world that we live in with so much unpredictability, do you think that's one of the reasons why people choose to rely or cling to this whole exercise of predicting what's going to happen? Well, I mean, um, especially with what we've seen recently, um, for example, what the gentleman just mentioned about Australia, um, the margin of, of of, of error was 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 uh, was not a lot. There was not a big difference in how both these parties were polling. So it's obviously a human exercise, which is subject to some sort of um, unpredictability. And I think that's okay. Um, we've seen in the recent, um, well, not so recent anymore, in the Brexit polls, uh, we saw something similar happening. I mean, when the when there's something which where there's not a big uh, margin of difference in the opinion. You're going to see that, and you're going to see um, what you would say wrong results. But if, like I said earlier, if you use it as a tool to understand and to help you, um, for example, form policy or um, even for political parties to know what they're aiming for and how to um, coalesce their support, then I think that's, that's the way to go, rather than 100% relying um, solely on, on opinion polls. Right. And yes, uh, Mr. Youngers, when we're talking about all this, do you think that we need to, uh, there needs to be a dramatic overhaul in the way we try to gauge with public opinion? I, indeed, I think that, that one of the major problems is that, that opinion polling has become such a, a business model, basically, has been such a popular uh, tool to use that nowadays there are so many different uh, organizations, uh, pollsters, uh, different newspapers, magazines who are all conducting their own version of political polls. And often they do this in a rather rushed way. You know, they, they, they take a so-called random group, but, but that not, it doesn't necessarily represent society. So I think there needs to be some sort of a better regulation of it that a poll uh, has to be taken in a perhaps more stratified way, you know, that they make sure that they don't just call random numbers or call, you know, interview random people and make it a few hundred or a few thousand and and then extrapolate that to the entire population. Actually, ideally, I think you need and some experts are saying that you need like a stratified poll. That, that means you need specific, you know, a certain percentage of, of, of men, of women, of, of people who are above a certain income level of, and below a certain income level, ethnic minorities, the represent, representative of the total percentage of ethnic minorities that there are in the country. But of course, all of this is a very, very long term and very expensive procedure to make. So that will, that is, that will make it a far less profitable as a business venture than it is right now. So I think maybe the only real way in which I see this happening is if, if it is more regulated. And then of course, that, that, that means more government regulation and more administrative um, 
matters coming into play, which may not always be very popular to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I believe that's the only way in which we can hopefully guarantee that there are, of course, not 100 percent trustworthy, but at least more trustworthy polls in the future. Right. Uh, but Mr. Yonkers, with government regulation, isn't there a danger of a governments in power influencing the information that's coming out? That is, of course, definitely that's definitely a problem. But I, I think it's either there will always be some sort of, of bias in it. So that's that's why there is no real easy answer. Like I don't claim that that is the right. the best answer to do it. Just the the only idea I can think of in which they can kind of regulate it better than it is right now. Right. And Mr. Kirby, do you think that's the go as well? Do you agree with uh, Mr. Yonkers here that it's better regulation that is required? Uh, no, I absolutely disagree. Uh, government regula regulation isn't going to uh, help anything. Uh, to be honest, uh, what would help uh, in order to get uh, a more fair picture uh, into the media space is for governments to back off and stop putting pressure onto smaller sources of media and stop trying to have a media monopoly. Uh, the more different voices we have in the media, the more likely that people are to have a more... Um, a wider, uh, deeper view of the events going on around them. Uh, so rather than trying for the government to regulate how CNN gets its polling material, I would like to see them have a lot more competition that's saying different things and challenging their views with their own and their own information and their own data. Right. And uh, uh, Mr. Harris, we see that Mr. Kirby and Mr. Yonkers have presented two opposing views about how uh, there should be a solution to this. But uh, something that Mr. Kirby said is that we need an increase in the competition. We need more voices out there competing to put out facts or put out information. In all of this, how should the audience, how should the general public be guided to vet information? Oh uh, yes, well, uh, the, these two gentlemen have have their own solutions, but I think the solution is somewhere in between. Actually, um, there is no reason why a government cannot invite the industry to form some sort of code of conduct um, that they can uh, that they all agree to, which which uh, with government guidance that the industry themselves agree to. Uh, for example, I mean, we were talking about bias. Um, sometimes it's um, a, a leading question can actually influence your whole survey. I mean, you can um, basically um, manipulate uh, the answers depending on the questions that you ask. Or um, secondly, sometimes you can ask innocuous questions which people have not really made up their minds about and, and push them in a certain way, in a certain direction to, um, uh, uh, to sort of propagate whatever policy that you want to, uh, that you want to be followed. So, I mean, there's obviously uh, the problem with, um, with media organizations. I mean, somebody's paying for them, uh, somebody's going to influence them. So I think the best way to go is if the industry forms their own code of conduct and, um, and they abide by it, I think, uh, rather, than, um, uh, rather than any government control. But something needs to be done. And, right. Um, Right, and that's the point, the point that uh, seems to go throughout our entire panel that joined us today, that something needs to be done because the state of affairs, which is causing for, the, uh, for misinformation, is just adversely impacting a public opinion. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Kirby, for joining us. Thank you, Professor Steve Keen, for joining us. Thank you, Bresh Yonkers, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Richard Harris, for joining us. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again next week with more stories. Goodbye and take care.